We need a new system. We need a new society. We need to demand that which may have sounded impossible even a few weeks ago, but is not only realizable, but an imperative necessity. The war in Ukraine enters a new phase. Leaders of NATO meet in Brussels and fear a negotiated settlement between the Zelensky government and Russia. Today we talk about the internal politics in Ukraine, the role of the far right, the fascists, and neo-Nazis. Welcome to The Real Story on The Socialist Program. I'm your host, Brian Becker. Today we'll be talking to Dr. Gabriel Rockhill. He is a founding director of the Critical Theory Workshop and professor of philosophy at Villanova University. You can check out his latest article at liberationnews.org. It's called Nazis in Ukraine, Seen Through the Fog of Information War. Dr. Rockhill, welcome. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Uh, As I mentioned in the intro, uh, NATO leaders are meeting in Brussels, and I was right before this show looking through the news accounts, and they're clearly worried that Zelensky might actually agree to a compromise settlement with Russia. Uh, It's quite interesting. Uh, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, says, oh, yes, of course we support uh, Zelensky's right to, to negotiate, but of course there are also limits, and we're sure that his, he's focused on victory, meaning the U.S. wants to win the war, and in many ways, Ukraine is a proxy war for the United States. They want to win the war. They don't want to end the war. All these crocodile tears about Ukrainians, and of course, the suffering of Ukrainian people is real, uh, but the crocodile tears from the same people who don't want a negotiated settlement, and the same people who actually refuse to negotiate in good faith Uh, prior to the February 24th Russian military invasion into Ukraine, uh, I don't think they give a damn about the people in Ukraine. And I think it's quite clear by the tone and tenor of the comments on the sidelines at the NATO summit that they don't care. Oddly, uh, or maybe it's not so odd, Dr. Rockhill, there's other sectors within Ukrainian politics who also don't want the war to end. You know, and who also have been preparing for the war. And by those forces, I mean the right sector, the Azov Battalion, the other far-right parties, the parties that are either fascist or neo-Nazis. Of course, Putin announced on February 24th that the purpose of the Russian invasion was to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. And some people, I think, wrongly got the impression that Ukraine is a you know, a fascist country, which of course it's not. But that doesn't mean that there aren't fascist forces in Ukraine. And it doesn't mean even if they are a relatively small part of the body politic, that they don't play a very important and at some points decisive role, which brings us to your article uh, on liberationnews.org. I want you to talk about that, about what's what the real sort of relationship of forces is between the far right in Ukraine. Uh, And then after that, I want to go back to a misnomer that the United States government, because it fought against Nazi Germany and defeated Germany, is committed to a path of opposition to fascism in Europe and elsewhere. But let's start with the internal situation What's your estimate of what's going on or has been going on in Ukraine, especially since the 2014 coup in in Maidan that toppled the old government? Well, probably the best place to start is the longstanding interest on the part of the United States government and, of course, the capitalist ruling class that oversees its political elite in supporting militias and fascist forces that fight against, you know, originally during the so-called Cold War against socialist uh, Soviet Union, but then they continue that fight in various ways against what is now a capitalist country, but a country that they do not want to have kind of emerge as uh, a force that would call into question some of their imperialist reign 
over the world. And so one thing I think it's really important for your viewers and listeners to understand is that, yes, it is indeed the case that there's a you know purported liberal democracy within Ukraine, like there's a purported liberal democracy in the United States. But that does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that there aren't fascist forces and very important ones that are involved in military operations that run both private vigilante militias, but then also that run militias that have been integrated into the army. It also doesn't mean that there's not a widespread cultural fascism. We, again, I think your viewers and listeners should think both about the Ukraine and about the United States in these instances, where there is a celebration and a glorification of Ukraine's past, particularly its collaboration with Nazi forces. There's also been a direct cultural attack on the communist history of Ukraine. And I hope we'll have an opportunity to talk about the anti-communization laws, which basically make it illegal now to uh, celebrate the Soviet Union, its symbols and other such things. And so it's a, a multifaceted phenomenon that people have to understand where you can have a purported liberal government that nonetheless financially supports and aids and abets both fascist forces and the kind of symbolic or cultural war that's going on that's trying to make Nazism, fascism, something that should not only be palatable and acceptable, but in fact defended and celebrated as, as kind of freedom fighters and other such things. So this is just a beginning point, but a kind of big picture overview of some of these issues. Uh, indeed. Let's talk about the, the Azov Battalion and right sector and those forces uh, and the role they have played internally in Ukraine, Ukraine's politics. In the parliamentary elections in 2019, the far right uh, fielded candidates, and they got a fairly small percentage of the vote, I think about 2.1% or something like that. They, in fact, even lost seats that they had held in the parliament. So when Putin makes the assertion that we have to invade Ukraine to denazify Ukraine, it would seem like, well, wait a second, the Nazis or the fascists or the far right, they call themselves nationalists, by the way. They don't always, you know, they use Nazi or fascist uh, emblems and insignia and slogans and icons. Uh, but, you know, they, pr they present themselves as Ukrainian nationalists, essentially. So they, they basically did quite poorly in the parliamentary election but when you go back to Maidan, what happened in February 22nd, 2014, there was a coup d'etat the day after the previous government, the Yanukovych government, that was trying to balance between East and West. It wasn't pro-Russia. It wasn't anti-EU. Yanukovych, a corrupt uh, but democratically elected government, wanted to integrate Ukraine into, uh, into the EU. The EU gave... Ukraine an ultimatum that said, basically, look, you accept our deal, the terms of your entrance into the EU, which is not as a full partner, it's called an EU association agreement, uh, which basically was an austerity plan for uh, Ukrainians, like what the EU imposed on, on the Greeks, except, except maybe even worse. And Yanukovych said, well, we want to come into the EU, but we don't want that deal. So I, we say no. And the EU said, look, this is an ultimatum. Take it or leave it. And at that point, the people in Western Ukraine in particular, who are more oriented towards Europe, start having protests in Maidan, in the center of Kiev. That's September, October 2013. And the protests go on and on and on. And then finally, on February 21st, uh, 2014, the, uh, the Yanukovych government comes to a negotiating table with the opposition. Uh, Yanukovych agrees to pull the police out of Maidan. There had been lots of street fighting. There was violence on both sides. He says, look, we'll pull the cops out of Maidan. Uh, we agree to early elections, devolve political authority, basically giving in to the demands of the opposition. And the next day, the opposition, led by these forces, actually stormed the parliament. Uh, using violence, disperse the parliament and try to kill Yanukovych, and he flees for his life. Again, at that moment, it's clear that the far right, while small in number later, or even perhaps then, in terms of their parliamentary support, from a physical point of view, play a decisive role. We know in American history the role of the mob, 
the violent right-wing racist white supremacist mob has been very decisive at certain moments. Anyway, let's go back to that point and then what does it say about their emerging political trajectory? Did they gain power? Did they lose power? How did it happen? Yeah, this is such an important point because we can look at parliament and this is one sector of society and it's true that uh, prior to, you know, I think the if I'm not mistaken, it was in 2010 that uh, Svoboda, the Freedom Party, which is an extreme ultranationalist right wing party, I think they, they garnered about 10 percent of the vote, which was a kind of high point. And as you pointed out in the most recent parliamentary elections, they you know got 2.15 percent and it didn't even go beyond the 5 percent that was necessary in order to have representation in parliament. And that does not mean, though, if you don't have representation in the parliament, that there aren't forces on the ground. And so the Maidan coup is, of course, so important for understanding. It really sets the stage for what's going on today. And people need to recognize the fact that the conflict or the war in the Ukraine didn't start in 2022. In many ways, it started in 2014. And we'll kind of hopefully flesh out some of that context. And so one of the key elements was the funding and support, of course, on the part of the United States and other imperialist powers in the West. Victoria Nuland, this is regarding the Maidan coup, actually bragged about, you know, spending some five billion dollars in the Ukraine. And what was that money put to? I mean, it's put to a number of things, but one was supporting, propping up, militarily training and arming battalions like the Azov Battalion. And you're absolutely right, and I hope we'll touch on this too, that Azov today has been reworking their image. And so the leader of the Azov Battalion was interviewed just a few years ago and said, well, there's probably about 10 or 20 percent of us who are Nazis, but the rest of us aren't, you know, 100 percent Nazis. Uh, this is, you know, uh, trying to basically take an ultra-nationalist, anti-socialist, pro-capitalist orientation and say, well, it wasn't exactly identical to what the Nazis were doing. At one level, that's true, right? But there's an enormous continuity between these projects and the fact that you'd have the Azov Battalion having 10 to 20% of Nazis means that all of the other members of the battalion are at an absolute minimum fascist Nazi collaborators, right? So the Azov Battalion was born in 2014 and played a really important role in the Maidan coup along with right sector and other fascist militias. Uh, they helped consolidate the power for the post-coup government. They ran intimidation campaigns against leftists, uh, as well as against various political leaders. They ended up setting up indoctrination camps for the youth, right? So they played a very significant role in civil society and in the immediate kind of street battles. In fact, one of the moments of the Maidan coup that is so important, and it's often referred to as perhaps the greatest Nazi or fascist atrocity since World War II is when 42 leftists were incinerated by fascists in the Oseta Trade uh, Union building. And so this street uh, violence was a really central element in the Maidan coup. And then it, of course, was juxtaposed within at least mainstream Western media to this idea that these were democratic uprisings that were nonviolent, that were just calling for kind of greater democracy. And so again, we see this, this uh, the, the way in which a lot of the propaganda machine attempts to uh, deflate the violence on the, port, uh, on the part of these fascist forces and inflate the kind of democratic component or supposedly democratic component that was operative. What's also important for this story is the Azov Battalion was then integrated into the Ukrainian National Guard. And this pattern, people should know, is exactly the same pattern that happened in Nazi Germany, right, where you had the SS troops that were originally vigilante troops, and then they were integrated into the state apparatus once power was consolidated. Same thing happened in Italy, right, with the black shirts. So these you know, might have slightly different histories, but there are patterns that we really have to understand and identify. And since 2014, there has been an ongoing assault on the Russian separatist movement in eastern Ukraine because the Russian dominant population in these regions, once fascists came to power, decided that they didn't want to be part of Ukraine anymore and would be better served by you know, reuniting with, with Russia in some capacity. And so what the Ukrainian government has done both during, you know, in the wake of the Maidan coup and continuing through the Zelensky government is to wage 
an ongoing war against the Russian separatists in which they use these fascist battalions and forces as well as the Ukrainian army in order to crush the what they often refer to as cockroaches. And this has led to the death of 14,000 people in eastern Ukraine, what the Russian government refers to as a genocidal rampage. And it's part of the justification, as you said, that Putin has put forth for why a military intervention was necessary. And again, I'm not saying that it was necessary or agreeing with Putin, but that is the thinking behind the decisions that he's made. In a, in a moment, uh, Gabriel, we're going to play an audio clip from Andrei uh, Beletsky. He's one of the leaders of the Azov Battalion, talking about the role they played in Maidan. Because in, the, in Maidan, in the protests, uh, it would be... It would be a caricature to say the people were fascist because they were protesting against Yanukovych. Uh, many different political currents were there. There was an anti-corruption element of the protest. There was a desire to be with the EU from people who historically in the western part of Ukraine uh, didn't look to Russia. They looked more to, the, to Europe. Um, there was, you know, a very, it was a very diverse group. But that's true about all social movements. And I think that uh, Beletsky in this audio, in this video clip that we're going to show, actually describes that, yes, we, are, we, the fascists, are a minority, but we are a decisive minority. And I think that's really important for people to understand. It's like when you think about what happened on January 6th. A lot of the people on January 6th were there because Donald Trump told them, look, the Democrats you know, violated democracy. They stole the election. Uh, we have to stand together. We can't let our country be taken. So they came because they, you know, they heard the, the person who they followed, Donald Trump, and they believed him. And then there were other fascist forces, the three percenters, the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, and they were very significant in terms of the intervention into the Capitol. Anyway, let's listen to this and watch this video clip from Andrei Boletsky. And again, it's him explaining what their real role was in Maidan. Нам зараз надавали стільки зброї не тому, що ми хороші, як нам кажуть, нам допомагає Захід, бо вони хочуть нам блага, тому що ми виконуємо задачі Заходу, тому що ми єдині, хто готові їх виконувати, бо нам весело, нам прикольно убивати і прикольно воювати. І вони думають, вау, давайте вже ну, подивимося, що це буде. Тому виник цей новий альянс, про який зараз говорить там, Туреччина, Польща, Британія, Україна. Тут ми тут флагман, тому що ми затіяли війну, якої не було вже останніх 60 років. Так от, уявіть собі, скільки в нас зброї, скільки в нас ветеранів. А це є, вже йдеться про те, що нові політичні альянси вже глобального рівня, нові політичні виклики. Націоналісти якби, були там ключовим фактором однозначно і на фронті. Зараз дуже багато є спекуляцій. Ну, нациків вже ж було небагато, там, ну, ЛГБТшники, там, посольства кажуть, ну, скільки там було там нациків? Ну, нациків там було там, 10% там, ну, запаяних, ідейних. Ну, це ж питання в тому, це може так казати лише Йоуд, який не був на війні, не знає, наскільки оцих от 10%, хоча там навіть, може, даже менше було, я думаю, націоналістів було, хай там, даже 8, ну, наскільки це в пропорції ефективно впливу, наскільки це складало просто галапуючи безкінечну підвищення ефективності. Не було б цих 8%, а б ефективність упала б на 90%. То тут не в числі мова. Так само, як на Майдані. Зараз вже почали ліваки, там фонди Бьоля, там і так далі перераховувати. Ну, націоналістів там було, там, да, вони були впливові, там. Та які впливові? Не було б націоналістів, все би це от, пішло би сразу на гей-парад. Вот. Мойський же сказав, що там, да, нацики, они там, я їх фінансував, чи він там, там помагав, тому що я хотів, щоб вони прогнали Януковича, не прогнали. Да, вони зараз там уроди, сквовачі і так далі, але вони це зробили. All right, Gabriel, uh, very interesting, because he's very proud. He says, look, yeah, we're 10%, maybe we're less, maybe we're 8%, but without us and without their, their ability to carry out violence, this would have been nothing but a gay parade. Which shows that while, yes, it's a diverse crowd protesting against Yanukovych, there were probably progressives, left, leftists, uh, the LGBTQ community, you know, lots of different people from the, especially the western part of Ukraine. The smaller but very violent force of the fascists is decisive. And that goes back to what you were talking a little bit about what happened actually in Germany in, in the rise of Hitler. Yeah, absolutely. As, as we know from if it be social movements that are progressive or right-wing social movements, uh, it's one thing to even get people in the street. And the people in the street are usually a minority of the overall, overall population. 
But then what happens in the street is largely dependent on those who take leadership within the street. And more specifically, those who are armed, connected to the state, financed by the capitalist ruling class. And this not only empowers them and gives them an enormous platform, but it allows them to act as really the leaders of certain sectors of of civil society or the or the street more broadly. And so I think it's really important to identify that, yes, quantitatively, it is the case that, you know, they in in, in Maidan and even today, they don't dominate uh, every aspect of society within Ukraine. But qualitatively, they play a central role, these fascist bat- uh, battalions like Azov and others, precisely because they're well-funded, they are well-armed, and they take up leadership positions that can really turn the tide, as they did in, in the, uh, the Maidan coup. And, you know, another thing that I'd just like to mention about this leader, uh, Andrei Belensky, whom we just heard, is that he's not only the leader of the Azov Battalion, he was the original founder as well, or involved in the leadership uh, and founding of both the Patriot, of, the Patriot of Ukraine and the Social National Assembly, which are right-wing, you know, ultra-nationalist, basically fascist groups within the Ukraine. So even just the Azov Battalion is one of some 30 militias that are operative, many of which self-identify or would be objectively identified as fascist. And one thing that Belinsky uh, is on the record stating, I think, should really stick with us, and that is, quote, the historic mission of our nation in this critical moment is to lead the white races of the world in a final crusade for their survival, a crusade against the Semite-led Untermenschen. Untermenschen, of course, is the term that the Nazis used for the inferior races, right? And so it's also important that the ideological orientation is so reactionary and extreme that this is what's driving some of these forces. Yeah, Ukrainian nationalism has, a, a, you know, it's a very complex story when you look at Ukrainian nationalism. Uh, of course, after, you know, Putin denounced uh, Vladimir Lenin and the policy of the Bolsheviks for having even created a republic called the Socialist Republic of Ukraine, that was in 1922 and then ratified by the 1924 Soviet Constitution. The policy of the Bolsheviks was to emphasize the rights and aspirations of non-Russian speaking populations that had been conquered by the Russian empire, including in this case, uh, people who spoke Ukrainian, who were part of Ukraine, the territory of Ukraine. Uh, The Soviet policy was to include the Donbass, that's the Eastern region, which is ethnically not Ukrainian, but Russian speaking but was a more industrial part of the country. Ukraine in 1922 was basically, the, t- the territory of Ukraine was basically very rural, very uh, agricultural, predominantly peasant, with an intelligentsia, of course, and, and a certain sort of bourgeois elite, but basically a peasant country. The Donbass, which was more of an industrial region and more Russian ethnically, was brought into Ukraine as... The Soviets constructed this very complex policy of trying to unite the Russian and non-Russian peoples of the former uh, Russian Empire who were now together, many of them, in the uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And the, the Bolshevik policy was to emphasize what was called indigenization, which meant uh, people in Ukrainian political offices should speak Ukrainian, schools should teach, and students should learn Ukrainian rather than just Russian. It was a very uh, multicultural approach towards uh, Ukrainian, the Ukrainian-speaking part of the population. So the, the big point that Putin is making is that this is really not a republic, it's not really a nation, it's not really... Uh, it should not be an independent policy. He said, if anything, uh, you could call it Vladimir Lenin's Ukraine. But in, of course, from our point of view, the point of view of the socialist program, the Bolshevik policy was a correct policy. It provided the basis for solidarity between the different peoples who made up the Soviet Union. And you know, for the longest time, from 1922 to 1991, most of the people in Ukraine and most of the people in Russia were sisters and brothers and comrades and 
shared the benefits of socialism together, built socialism together, defeated Nazi Germany when it invaded the country in 1941 together. Uh, they lost millions together. But there was an element of Ukrainian society that was never with that program. Stefan Bandera, the OUN, the, what are called the Ukrainian nationalists, uh, they actually did collaborate with Hitler. Uh, they had some differences with the German Nazis over what kind of sort of nationalism or fascism would be imposed on Ukraine. Of course, the Germans wanted to have it their way on all things. But uh, they were together in, in terms of fighting a mutual foe, which was the Russians and the Soviet Union. Let's just talk about that history because the same forces that we're talking about, the Azov Battalion, which is not simply a battalion now, it's an Azov movement, uh, the right sector, the other far right, they identify with the people who were working with the fascist invaders of Ukraine uh, in 1941. Let's talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Stepan Bandera is now considered that he was glorified with the Hero of, of Ukraine uh, Medal of Honor. And if we look into his history, you know, he was the one of the leaders of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, the OUN that you mentioned, um, as well as the Armed Wing, the Ukrainian Insurgent Army. And the positions that these two organizations took was to collaborate with the Nazis against the Soviet Union in World War II. And the OUN played a very significant part in the genocidal extermination that took place within the Ukraine. And in fact, according to some analyses, one quarter of the victims of the Holocaust were Ukrainian victims. And the these two organizations were involved in it. In fact, they were not only involved in it, but also did much of the dirty work that the Nazis themselves wanted to outsource, meaning the killing of children and the genocidal elimination of the civilian population. And what's extraordinary and also very important to know about this history is that uh, Stepan Bandera, as well as Mikolo Lebed, uh, Lebed was Bandera's chief of um, national security service. They were protected by the U.S. national security state in the wake of World War II. They weren't sent to Nuremberg. They weren't put in prison. There wasn't a global manhunt like the one they unleashed on Che Guevara. No, instead, they wanted to protect these figures as figures who are important because they did the most important work in the global class struggle, and that was the work of killing communists. And so they continued to not only protect the leadership, but then they integrated members of the OUN into the, you know, what was really a kind of fascist international architecture that was set up in the wake of World War II and also had predecessors before World War II. Uh, Frank Wisner, one of the CIA architects, claimed that you know, I believe the number was about 35,000 Soviets were killed between 1945 and 1953 by these Ukrainian national fascist forces with whom the CIA and the U.S. national security state was working. And so this is a very big and important part of this history. And one other element, Brian, that I know is really important to the work that you've been doing on the socialist program is how NATO relates to all of this, right? It sounds very much like the North Atlantic, you know, uh, is, is uh, the, that NATO itself is really just about preserving peace and protecting democracy in the Western world and other such things. No, on the contrary, they worked hand in glove with the Central Intelligence Agency and the U.S. national security state in recruiting fascists and Nazis, many of whom were from Ukraine. There's also a lot from Belarus and, and other places in order to continue to wage this constant war against the, the Soviet Union and more generally against socialism and communism. And so it's important to see the continuities here, right, so that we don't just get caught up in the most recent months of the war, but see that there's a deeper war that is an imperialist war that has the United States working with NATO in order to recruit, support fascist forces in the ongoing war on socialism, if it be the socialism that was manifest in the in the USSR, or leftist and progressive forces, as we know, Zelensky's banned eleven parties in the Ukraine. He's arrested communists, and again, he's refused to go back on the anti-communization laws. So there's a really direct, both symbolic and material, war on socialism that's going on in the Ukraine. Uh Dr. Rockhill, you had an article two years ago. We started this show by talking about your recent article in Liberation News, but 
you had an article two years ago in Counterpunch, uh, and the the title of it, uh, I believe, was the U.S. did not defeat fascism in World War II. It discreetly internationalized it. And some of the points that you're making are referenced also in that article. And I just want to bring it home to people how important this was. There, I mean, there was Operation Paperclip. There were other intelligence operations where the U.S. was deliberately recruiting senior leaders of not in, in Nazi Germany in the military, in the scientific community, and integrating them into the U.S. or into NATO, uh, into the Pentagon, into NASA. Um, I, I can remember reading an interview with um, Werner von Braun, who was the architect of the V2 rocket that was, you know, devastating London at, by Nazi Germany at the beginning of World War II. And when he was asked, well, how did he feel about having been brought to the United States? And he was, in fact, the architect of NASA and the, the man on the moon mission. Um, and they said, well, how, how do you feel to have uh, changed sides, you know, to be with your former enemies? And Werner von Braun said something, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but he said something like, Oh uh, well, we're not. We were. We were always really on the same side. Our real enemy was the communists. Our real enemy was the Soviet Union. But let's just talk about the dimensions of this, both for NATO, uh, how important Nazism, the the integration of Nazi military leaders was to NATO with NASA, with Operation Paperclip, uh, and and some of the intelligence uh, operations that went on for decades. Decades. They didn't stop right after World War II. Even when there was detente between the U.S. and Soviet Union in the 60s, a lot of these operations were very uh, robust, very aggressive. Yes, absolutely. And, and in that article, I, I give a lot of the references for some of the things that I'm going to say, because, of course, when you talk in this manner, people might uh, begin to wonder, well, what's what's the basis for these claims? And so I'd encourage people to dig in because it's actually extremely well documented. Right. So uh, Eric Lichtblau, for instance, in his research, he estimates about 10,000 Nazis were brought to the United States in the wake of World War II. 1,600 were brought in through Operation Paperclip and they were the brains of the Nazi war machine. They were given university positions. They were given research assistance. They were promised nationality if their research into weapons of war and destruction bore fruit. The Part of this operation also was securing the intelligence services of the fascists and Nazis and redeploying them against the Soviet Union. Uh, Reinhard Galen is one of the most important figures in this regard because he was brought to the United States. He was the head of the intelligence services in Nazi Germany against the Soviet Union, right? So he is an extremely important figure. He was recruited by the CIA brought to the United States, who's actually brought to a New York Yankees game, right, to kind of celebrate American culture, and then was put in charge of the intelligence services in Nazi Germany and proceeded to recruit many of the former associates, meaning Nazis, with whom he had worked. And this was not only in Nazi Germany. Um, Valeria Bulgaria, the, uh, the man referred to as the Black Prince, one of the leaders of what's called the neo-Nazi movement. But of course, we don't really need neo here. It's a continuation of the Nazi movement. He was one of the major fascists in Italy, and they did the same thing in Japan, right? So this was an international project. And the connection to NATO is really important. I point out in the most recent article that you highlighted that the chief of the general staff of the army under Hitler, Adolf Heusinger, was recruited by NATO and became the chairman of NATO's military committee. And this was only one of the Nazis who was integrated into the leadership of NATO. Hans Spiegel is another one, right, who oversaw and argued for the rearmament of West Germany and be took up a leadership position within NATO. And another very important part of this history, Brian, is Operation Gladio. And that was the set of secret stay behind armies that were established by NATO in all NATO countries, including uh, four neutral countries, that were stocked with fascists and Nazis. And the role of these uh, stay behind armies was purportedly that if the Soviet Union decided to move westward, these 
fascist militias would run sabotage campaigns and terror campaigns against the, the Soviet troops. That didn't happen, of course. So what did they do? Instead, they were activated in the strategy of tension in the 1960s and 1970s and began committing acts of terrorism against the civilian population that were blamed on socialists and communists in what's called you know, the strategy of tension, meaning the strategy of trying to hoodwink the civilian population into supporting law and order governments and an anti-communist orientation that had many, many leftists who were innocent arrested, slandered, uh, and other such things. And this, again, is un unbelievably well documented. The European Parliament has a resolution on Operation Gladio where they recognize that CIA, MI6, and NATO oversaw these uh, underground armies that were not controlled by the states themselves. They were overseen by this network of national security state operatives. In fact, I would encourage as well your listeners and viewers to check out, there's a documentary film, I believe it's on BBC, and it's, all, it's available on YouTube, where they have interviews with some of the fascists who committed these acts of terror, including um, Vincenzo Vinciguera, who explains in great detail how important it was as a fascist to kill children and women in these acts of terrorism and to blame it all on communists so that, you know, the psychological warfare would kind of parallel the terrorist warfare. And again, this was all overseen by NATO, right? Really important history for all of us to know. Daniel Ganser's book, NATO's Secret Armies, is the single best book, in my opinion, on this topic, but there are many others. It's so important because when we talk about the fog of war, which is included in the title of your most recent article in, the Lib in Liberation News, there is the fog of war where, you know, there's just uncertainty in war. Armies are fighting each other. People are shooting. There's chaos. You know, it's, there is a fog. You can't, like, really be sure what's actually happened. But then there's the deliberate fog of war, the deliberate propaganda that's designed and there's many, many articles about this that are coming out. They're sort of carefully worded in the West about how the U.S. is carefully using or releasing, quote, in declassified intelligence in order to create confusion, to create confusion in the United States among the American people, confusion inside of Russia. It's not a small part of war. I mean, it's always been a part of war, but now it's actually both a, a science and an art. Absolutely, Brian. And thank you so much for bringing this up, because, of course, there's the fog of war, but a lot of the fog of war is is produced by the fog machines. And the fog machines include the public relations companies and organizations, in fact, that far surpass the number of journalists, right? We have more people working in PR than in, in journalism. We now know, and it's important to look back at these moments of warfare and what exactly was going on in the ground. We now know that the Rendon Group, one of these PR firms, was paid $23 million by the Central Intelligence Agency to create anti-Saddam propaganda after the first invasion, right? Uh, we also know that Burst and Marsteller, one of the other major PR firms, right, they've received a lot of money to whitewash the Argentinian junta and do other such things. And so public relations and the war on the minds of the general population is absolutely essential to what's going on. I think it's also important that, you know, Ralph uh, McGee, who was a member of the Central Intelligence Agency for 25 years, probably said it most clearly. He said, one of the central functions of the Central Intelligence Agency is not to gather information and intelligence. It's to produce and disseminate disinformation to the general public. And that operation has included working with hundreds of journalists, right? This is all part of the public record. Look at the church committee. Look at Carl Bernstein's work on this. Literally hundreds, some 400 journalists uh, were in the pay of the CIA, according to Bernstein's account, uh, some 800, according to uh, Crudson's report that came out soon thereafter. And the number likely surpasses that. And the intelligence agencies also actually own news networks and news services, and many of them globally. Forum Service is one of the most uh, famous of them, but there, there are many others. And all of this kind of architecture amounts to what Frank Wisner referred to as the mighty Wurlitzer. They want to control the narrative in every single aspect of the narrative. And so they have fog machines that they've been perfecting for decades and decades. And we have to understand as progressives how those fog machines operate. And we need to cultivate media literacy. You know, it's one of the things that we're not trained in schools. 
we're generally not trained, even, even within the movement. You know, I think there needs to be a lot more critical media literacy. Who's paying for it? How are they framing it? How is it being disseminated? What are the public relations campaigns that are being run and why are they being run? And also a very important part of that is how can we build power in order to get uh, narratives that are grounded in the truth and in the broad social movement for progressive egalitarianism? How can we get that message across? And of course, Breakthrough is a very important platform for doing precisely that. So the, the fight back is essential. Yeah, we're we're focused right now on Europe and on Ukraine, but uh, this CIA use of fascists or the U.S. government's use of fascists or the Pentagon's use of fascists or the hiring of fascists, the training of fascists, it's truly global. And, you know, you have benign sounding names like the School of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia. Well, what was the role of that school? It was to train all of the military leaderships in Latin America, many of whom were operating death squads to, against the left. And so as you kill the left, as you destroy the left, as you imprison the left, you also at the same time have this propaganda war demonizing the left. Uh, you think back when, you know, when I, was a, when I was a kid, we heard about Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. And, you know, we were told, oh, Patrice Lumumba, he's awful. He's like a terrible dictator. He's a, a Soviet agent. And, of course, he was leading the struggle of the people of the Congo to break free from, uh, from colonialism and the genocide that had been imposed on the people of Congo and Central, Euro and Central Africa. But this is, this is a truly a global war. When you think about what's happened to Cuba, thousands, more than 3,000, a little bit less than 4,000 Cubans have died over the decades by terrorist operatives, mainly based in Miami, funded by the CIA, who plant bombs and carry out terrorist acts against Cuba. And then the Cubans are the ones, the Cuban government, the targets of the terrorism, and these are truly fascist forces, uh, the Cuban government is demonized and, and projected as the great abuser of human rights and has these draconian economic sanctions designed to create even more suffering among Cubans. And then with the hope that if, a, if the Cubans suffer enough, they'll blame their own government for their suffering, which is, of course, part of a willful U.S. strategy. So you have real war, you have economic war through sanctions, and then you have the information war Again, it's, it's a hybrid war, it's a coordinated war. Uh, no stone is left unturned by the people carrying out this war. Yeah, absolutely. And the School of the Americas, of course, is so important in, in this regard, as well as John Stockwell, <clears throat> a former member of the CIA, pointed out that there's also the public safety program. And the public safety program for decades uh, ran some of these training programs where they would hire <clears throat> Nazis and fascists in order to train militants uh, around the world. And in fact, to bring this back to the Ukraine, this is a very important part of why Ukraine, you know, you highlighted the, the, the natural resources and Ukraine's geostrategic positions, and, and these are also very important. But one element in the Ukraine that's important to understand is that it's a really a hub for the international fascist movement. In fact, according to one study over about six years, there have been some 17,000 fascists who have gone to Ukraine from 50 different countries in order to train with these Ukrainian battalions that have been propped up and supported by the U.S. national security state. And so this really is an international project uh, that encompasses both the military wing and the war for the hearts and minds of the general population, right? And, and, and this element, this latter element, you know, is particularly for people who might not be kind of as involved with political organizing is, is really important to foreground because there's so much, and we see it functioning in lockstep right now, right? With the unbelievable censorship, the way in which the general masses, at least within the U.S. context, really are just being fed the Kool-Aid, but they are drinking it in such a way they don't even recognize it. It's like they have a Kool-Aid IV, and they think that what we need to do is just defend the freedom of the Ukrainians against the Hitler-esque-like 
Russian invasion. And all of that really misses this broader contextualization. And so the weaponization of information is a big part of warfare, if not the central part. You know, I've looked at so many internal documents through Freedom of Information Act requests where the national security state says as much. The most important war is the war for the hearts and minds of the masses, right? Because killing takes time and energy and you have to run cover operations and other such things. And so the propaganda war is something, you know, I, I know I'm going on a little bit at length and maybe this would be better for another show, but the, the propaganda war is one of the central wars that's going on and it's constant. And we're given a vantage point right now into how powerful it is in really making the American people line up for what is, in short, a, uh, a call for greater military intervention in the Ukraine and the risks of World War III. I want to go back for a moment to the, to the internal politics in Ukraine. Uh, Zelensky won the presidency on a program of building peace with Russia and ending the civil war that started after the Maidan coup in 2014. Zelensky speaks Russian. He, he's from a Jewish family. He grew up in the eastern part of the country. He promised peace. And he won a very surprising, uh, you know, a really surprising number of votes, a big majority, actually. Now, the 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 force that he fought against and beat was uh, Pedro uh, Poroshenko, who was very a uh, Russophobe, really, you know, very much promoting the war in the eastern part of the country. Uh, as we said, the fascists lost many of their positions, or they they had a very small vote in that same election, less than less than three percent, about two point one percent. So Zelensky comes in, and he's not a fascist. Zelensky was not a fascist. But about two years ago, in 2020, this very important press conference happened where one of Zelensky's senior advisors, also a, a comedian, by the way, uh, was talking about Minsk II was the way to go forward for peace. And I think the press conference may have been in Maripol or one of the eastern cities. And the, the Azov Battalion people march in and they point their finger at him and say, you are a traitor. You are committing treason against our country. And the reason is that he classified what was going on in the eastern part of the country as a civil war. And he said, and they said, the Azov fascists said, this isn't a civil war. This is a war between Ukraine and Russia. And by you characterizing it as a civil war between Ukrainians, that shows that you're a traitor. And then he retorts. He says, no, actually, if we want to have peace, we have to live up to the Minsk, Minsk agreements. There were two of them. Then the Azov people start chanting, and they march to the front of the, of the press conference, and they take this guy, he's an older guy, and they throw him down on the ground. And that's how the press conference ends. And a little bit later, I think a week later, he's fired. Now, he's a senior advisor to Zelensky. He's fired after, I mean, some of the Azov people were also arrested for doing this, but he's fired. He's let go. Now, over the past period, you have Zelensky banning 11 parties. All of the opposition news stations have been shut down. There's been the creation of a centralized state run media campaign openly, and he said, we must have a unified information policy. The parties that are shut down are parties that have a strong political base in the country. They're not minor, some of them are not minor parties. Uh, they were the parties that favored Ukraine being neutral and favored peace with Russia. And of course, 43% of the population in Ukraine speaks Russian as their first language. Uh, and, you know, when you look at that record and you see what Zelensky's actually done, he's partnering with the people who he was originally not partnering with. And the people who he was partnering with before have been let go. So in a way, you know, Zelen we have to, there has to be nuance in this presentation. Zelensky, not a fascist, but in order to survive politically, I believe, has made a pact with the fascists. 
And the United States is openly made a pact with the fascists because they are training these military units. Now, John Conyers and some progressives in Congress uh, passed or tried to pass legislation in 2015 in the U.S. Congress forbidding, outlawing the use of U.S. tax dollars to, to train the Azov Battalion. But since then, the Pentagon has gone out of its way to train them. So if you have Zelensky, who's got this strong, violent, fascist current, you have the U.S. government, which is actually supporting them. And Zelensky caught in the middle. It's not a matter of whether he's personally courageous or brave or not. Maybe he is brave. But politically, you can't really survive in the political environment in Ukraine of the last couple of years without taking this hardline anti-Russia position. And now we have this meeting that started Wednesday in, in Brussels for NATO where all of the NATO leaders are saying, yes, we want a negotiated settlement, but not at any cost. You can't make compromises that allow Russia to claim any kind of victory. Meaning Zelensky's under pressure internationally too. I don't think he has really much room to maneuver for a settlement. So in a way, Zelensky may be, while he's being touted in the West, he may be sort of an accidental figure and actually not that important as an individual because the larger political forces are really determining the outcomes here. I think that's such an important point, Brian, particularly because if people know about Zelensky's past, you kind of alluded to this in passing, he was, he was an actor. And what did he play? Well, he played a Ukrainian president, you know, someone who ran for the president and was elected president on an anti-corruption bill so or platform. And the TV show was released on a TV channel that was um, partially owned by uh, Ihor Kolomyovsky, who's also an important figure in all of this because he was the principal funder of Zelensky's campaign for president. Right. So we have and we can think of other examples in the past. Right. Reagan comes to mind or, or Trump, for that matter. Right. These TV celebrities turn presidents who have uh, enormous financial backers. An important part of this, though, too, and I couldn't agree more that these are these are complex relationships and we should never just flatten them and have kind of simplistic narratives like Zelensky's a fascist or all Ukrainians are fascist or other such things. This gets us nowhere, really. Um, because it's untrue and also because it just uh, leads to kind of uh, bickering and infighting of, of, of the most uh, reductive sort. But it is true that Kolomyovsky, Ihor Kolomyovsky, this, uh, you know, he's touted to be the third richest man in, in Ukraine, funded Zelensky's rise to power, also provided, you know, security for him and other such things. And we know from the Pandora Papers has a number of financial entanglements with Zelensky. He, this... Uh, oligarch also funds the Azov Battalion and is on record funding other ultra-nationalist fascist battalions that have been fighting Russian separatists. And so behind the puppet, if you will, of Zelensky, you have the network of capitalist ruling class interests manifest in Kolomyovsky, but there are, of course, others as well within uh, Ukraine and internationally who have been, been funding these interests. And as you rightly point out, also the role of the international pressure being exercised by NATO, the U.S., uh, and, and so forth. And so Zelensky himself, I think, is, is in a position in which there's not a lot of room for maneuver. And on top of that, with the Russian separatist movement in the East, at least according to a number of the reports that I've looked at, you know, the Ukrainian army was kind of overrun. They did not have the capacity. And so one of the reasons that the capitalist ruling class and political elites will rely on these parallel structures of fascist militias prior to being or that aren't integrated into the state is precisely because they don't have the capacity themselves. Right. And so if you look at Zelensky's positions, he's ended up being kind of fine with the ultimate result, which is allowing these fascist organizations to act with impunity because it kind of gets the job done when the Ukrainian state wasn't able to get it done. Another aspect of Zelensky, though, I think that is important is his ongoing support for these anti-communization laws, which, which literally do, I mean, they don't only render you know, any references to uh, the Soviet Union or the positive aspects of communism, th they're actually criminalized, right? So it's, it's illegal now to, um, to celebrate 
the USSR and its heritage within within the Ukraine, and you can actually face prison time, like five to ten years, depending on what exactly you say or what symbolic manifestations are. And another aspect of this is that there's a second law that recognizes that these controversial ultranationalist groups that we were just talking about, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, the Ukrainian Insurgent uh, Army, which were Nazi collaborators, um, they need to be recognized as independence fighters. And it's a criminal offense in the Ukraine to question the, le- the legitimacy of their actions. Right. So Zelensky has allowed for and continued the project of, you know, a kind of cultural anti-communism and a cultural support for ultranationalism and ultimately certain forms of fascism as well. So these are just additional aspects of what I agree is a very complex a phenomenon that needs to be understood in all of its intricacies. And and again, for our audience that may think, you know, they look at the, the with horror at the war and the suffering of Ukrainian civilians. By the way, a half a million Ukrainian civilians have come back uh, into Ukraine and just in the past couple of days, as, uh, which is important. It's, it hasn't gotten a lot of coverage that so many Ukrainians are a, able actually to come back. Uh, and sadly, tragically, uh, disgustingly, at the U.S.-Mexican border, Ukrainians are still being you know, brought in in large numbers. 100,000 will be taken in while uh, families from Syria or Yemen or Central America are just sitting watching. They've been sitting there for months. Uh, the racist character of this thing is also very, very obvious. But anyway, my point being that you know, when you look at the, the whole situation, um, we have the rise of, of a movement that's dominant in Ukraine, the right wing, even if they're not really the majority. And you can see in the writings of the Azov Battalion that it's no longer just a battalion. It's a movement. And it's, it's entering many, many spheres. I mean, there's sports, there's mixed martial arts, uh, all kinds of cultural elements, and they're attempting to gain what they call cultural hegemony. And at the same time, Zelensky has not out, not only outlawed these 11 other parties and banned the other uh, opposition TV networks, the Ukrainian Communist Party has also been banned since 2015. While it's illegal to talk about the Soviet Union and the Russian-Ukrainian partnership to defeat Nazi Germany, you know, that's not legal. You're, you could be punished criminally for saying good things about the defeat of fascism. The Ukrainian Communist Party is completely suppressed, literally suppressed in its entirety. And so for people in the West who think, you know, yeah, we look at Ukraine, we feel their suffering, and start to think, well, Ukraine represents liberal, democratic, progressive values. It doesn't right now. And that doesn't mean you have to think Zelensky was a fascist, but you just look at the reality of how this is shaped up. This is not a progressive a government, a progressive force, and it won't have a progressive outcome. Zelensky, by the way, uh, was talking to Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, and this is the headline from Haaretz. Zelensky says post-war Ukraine will emulate Israel, quote, won't be liberal European, close quote. Now, what that means is that, the, like, Israel is, carries out a, a police state operation against non-Jewish people uh, in, in occupied Palestine and legitimizes apartheid. And so when Zelensky says we won't, you know, be post Post-war, we won't be liberal Europeans. We're going to emulate Israel. I think we know exactly what that means. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one way of kind of framing this that I think is is perfectly in line with a lot of what you've been saying is that what we can refer to as a dialectical analysis, and I'll keep this very simple, is an analysis that really looks at the complexity of historical and social situations and doesn't just reduce them to single factors, right? Right. And what you have in the Ukraine is, you know, a purported liberal democracy or a bourgeois democracy. And that is, of course, preferable to something like an open authoritarian government or an openly fascist government. And we should never, I don't think, be confused about that. 
But liberal democracies of this sort have a long and sordid history of aiding and abetting and working with fascist elements within broader society because it allows them to kind of outsource some of the state violence. It also allows them to purportedly maintain some credibility and legitimacy because it's these battalions that are doing things, not, you know, the state itself and other such things. And so that relationship between bourgeois democracy on the one hand and fascist forces on the other is, is really important to, to recognize. And of course, your allusions earlier to if it be January 6th or movements within the United States are also, of course, something very similar, right? We can't simply say that, well, the United States is a bourgeois democracy, therefore fascism is not an issue at all. No, on the contrary, we've got to do a dialectical analysis of the details of the situation. And I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, so I just want to go back to it. And, and make sure that I highlighted it. This funder of Zelensky, Kolomyovsky, also is one of the major funders of the Azov Battalion. But I, and excuse me if I already mentioned that, but I want to make sure I highlighted this because a lot of these forces are then actually supported by the capitalist ruling class. And so the capitalist ruling class stands behind bourgeois democracies that it funds and supports, as well as some of these fascist elements. And so a dialectical analysis is also looking for, well, what are the driving forces behind society and economics? Well, it's, it's the economic base, really. It is the capitalist ruling class that marshals these different political and social projects. And so the last thing that I'll say is you're so right that Azov Battalion is not just a battalion, right? Some of it has been integrated into the National Guard, the Ukrainian National Guard, but it's, it's now often referred to as almost a state within a state. They run indoctrination camps. They have publishing houses. You know, this is really a cultural hub for the international fascist movement. And we now know that there are some people who have trained uh, in these uh, organizations or with, with Azov that are most likely connected to acts of terror and extreme right wing violence on U.S. soil. Right. So we also have to see fascism as a kind of international phenomenon and connect the dots so that we don't think that Ukraine is some just you know distant thing that doesn't have anything to do with our experience here in the United States or for that matter in Western Europe or other places that your viewers and, and listeners might be situated. Very, very important points. Uh, Gabriel, we uh, talked uh, along with Claudia de la Cruz earlier about the rise of fascism and we promised everyone we were gonna come back and have a discussion with the three of us together about it and then um, I, the Ukraine war has happened, so we're sort of focused on that. We want to come back and do a longer series on the, the precise uh, issue that you're raising, that fascism is not an accidental phenomena. It's not simply a mistake. It's not just the lunatic fringe. It's an organic connection of capitalism or capitalism in crisis. But the, the, the point that you're making, which I think is so important, it's the same point that you started your uh, article in Counterpunch in 2020, when you quoted George Jackson, where George Jackson is making the point, the former political prisoner who was executed, that bourgeois democracy and fascism aren't like divided by this great big wall. It's not like on one side of the Himalayas is, is the wonder world of bourgeois democracy and on the other bad, ugly side is fascism. I mean, when you think about America, for instance, you have bourgeois democracy in starting in 1783 and elections for some, some people could vote, you know, propertied white men. For a big part of the population, for some of the states, the majority of the population were enslaved people, enslaved, kidnapped Africans. For other parts of the population of North America, they were going to, they were about to be hunted down and, and slaughtered so that the Bourgeois uh, the leaders of bourgeois democracy could steal their land. And that's what happened to the indigenous populations. And when you think about the evolution of bourgeois democracy, which again, yes, is better than fascism, but this element of white supremacy, this element of extreme uh, violence and repression and the glorification of violence, the use of you know, pre-capitalist forms like slavery to build capitalism and to enrich the bourgeoisie, uh, as well as just theft and looting from other people. It's a fine line, actually, not a thick red line between fascism and bourgeois democracy, a fine line. And, and even when you think about, uh, in, you know, Operation Gladio and, and the other things that you're talking about with the CIA, John Foster Dulles, 
Uh, and his brother, Alan Dulles, John Foster Dulles was the Secretary of State. Alan Dulles was the head of the first CIA in 1947. They were admirers of Hitler. It, if there hadn't been geostrategic differences, they would have been all about Hitler. They really admired the German Nazi model, as did many American bourgeois political figures. It, it turned out they had a, a strategic falling out and they went to war against each other. But their attitudes towards Nazism obviously never changed because as soon as the war ended and when John Foster Dulles, by the way, the Dulles Airport in Washington is named after him, a Nazi admirer, and Ellen Dulles, they immediately recruited the same Nazis and said, okay, look, let's get back on the same team. So I think, and I'm going to end the, this interview with you on this point, which is, you know, there is a, a, an important difference between bourgeois democracy and fascism, but there's also so much in bourgeois democracy that's awful uh, because it's not just about voting every two or four years. All the systems of repression, which are in many ways identical to fascism, and the fact that bourgeois Democrats can use fascists to carry out their own bourgeois objectives show that if you really want to fight fascism, you can't rest your or, or sort of invest your, your hopes and dreams and aspirations and strategic outlook on promoting democracy within the framework of the capitalist system. There has to be an alternative uh, to both to bourgeois democracy and fascism. And of course, our show is called The Socialist Program, which, which preaches the idea that people should cooperate, there should be international solidarity, we're for peace and against militarism, but we can only accomplish those things within the framework of socialism, where the, the sort of toxic competition, including competition between states that's emblematic of modern day capitalism is done away with. Anyway, with all of that, uh, Gabriel, I know uh, you've thought a lot about this. You've written a lot about this. I want to have you and Claudia de la Cruz come back so we can keep talking about it. But I'm going to give you the final word. Well, thank you, Brian. Yes, I agree that, you know, the Dulles brothers and many others of the political and economic elite in the United States admired what was going on in Nazi Germany and in fascist Italy and in Japan, for that matter, and really did support that project and were against the U.S., entering the war on the side of the Soviet Union. Alan Dulles is on record as saying as much. We're fighting the wrong enemy because the Nazis are Aryan, pro-Christian, and most importantly, pro-capitalist like us, and unlike the Bolsheviks or the, you know, the Soviet Union. And the Nazis returned the admiration, right? The Nazis actually, they, they studied the US legal system and Hitler explained that the form of racial apartheid operative in the United States was the most advanced form of white supremacy. And they modeled some of the legislation and the state building project of Nazi Germany on the United States. Right? There's an interesting book from a liberal perspective called The Nazis American Model. Um, it has its limitations, but it goes into some of these details. But to frame kind of a lot of the issues that you highlighted in a way that I have found helpful, I would say that one of the things that's operative under bourgeois democracy is that there are different modes of governance, meaning different populations are governed in very different ways. And so if you're a member of the middle class or upper middle class, you're most likely governed by a bourgeois democracy. You have rights that are more or less respected and other such things, as long as you don't get politically out of line. But if you look at the history of bourgeois democracies, like the United States, of course, you also have other populations that are targeted for constant harassment, violence, incarceration, death, uh, vigilante violence, and other such things. So fascism has functioned as a kind of parallel mode of governance for poor working class communities, racialized communities, and insurgent kind of socialist communities. And the history of the Ku Klux Klan and the other organizations that you touched on, you know, Proud Boys and other organizations today, should give us pause to think, well, does the entire U.S. population live in a bourgeois democracy or are there only certain class sectors that are able to, you know, be protected by the rights of bourgeois democracy and others that are targeted for elimination in various ways? And the same thing goes for the relationship between the national and the international context. And this is maybe a good point to conclude on. And that is that many people think, well, the United States is a bourgeois democracy. It's not fascist. But then look at the foreign policy, right? The United States since World War II has sought to overthrow some 50 foreign governments. 
And it has worked, many of them democratically elected. It has worked with fascists, fascist militias, death squads, uh, propped up dictators and other such things. So it's very naive to think that, well, the United States is a bourgeois democracy. You know, obviously, I was just saying it's not really just domestically because there's these fascist modes of governance. But it's also internationally, it deploys these fascist modes of governance in order to tame the global working class and force them into abiding by the agenda of, you know, that's that's pushed by the United States. And of course, and this is really my final world, of course, what all of this means is that we can't simply support bourgeois democracy against fascism because there are two different modes of governance operative under the same socioeconomic system, which is capitalism. So we need to go to the root causes of these, so this, these social and political systems and to root out fascism, we not only have to root out the fascists and the fascist organizations, we also have to root out the elements in bourgeois democracy that aid and abet them. And we have to change the socioeconomic system. And under socialism, you have a system in which you don't have, of course, you have external uh, you know, uh, interventions and the attempt to support ultranationalist movements and things like that within actually existing socialist countries. But the socialist platform is not one that allows for, that fosters and aids and abets these forms of uh, this mode of governance in which you target particular populations for discipline, for punishment, and, and for elimination. So if we want to be serious about fighting fascism, we need to do it internationally, and we have to do it on a positive project of seeking to establish socialism as the only alternative to the system that we currently have, which aids and abets fascism in various ways. Dr. Gabriel Rockhill, thank you for joining the conversation. Thank you.